Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to Quantum Mechanics for the Working Professional. This is yet another problem solving session. Uh, today we're going to be focusing in on some of the other problems in section three. That is to say we're going to focus in on section three, problem two, problem seven, and problem eight all in one go. So <laughs> buckle up, let's get started. All right, so problem 3.2 uh, basically asks you to prove the Euler relation. Um, Euler relation for complex numbers is simply the fact that e to the i theta, where theta is an angle, right, or a real number, uh, is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. And you're asked to do this by using the uh, exponential function, right? The, uh, the definition of the exponential function e to the x is just the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n factorial, uh, x to the n. That's the definition, right? So if you like, that's just equal to like 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial, which is 6 x cubed, and so on and so on and so on. Part of this exercise is to get you familiar with a famous relationship from complex numbers. Part of this exercise is to point out what happens to e to the i theta. And finally, part of this exercise is to just get you back in the game of dealing with these special functions, these exponential functions and infinite sums and other kinds of things that you've probably seen before and you wanted to forget because you took a co college calculus course. <laughs> but welcome back because you're studying quantum mechanics and they're important. Uh, and if anything, the Euler relationships make it easy for you to do these calculations quickly. So let's do it, right? Uh, good. So to that end, let us begin. First, by observing that i squared is equal to what? Is equal to minus 1, by definition. i cubed, therefore, is equal to what? It's equal to i squared times i, which is just minus 1 times i, which is just minus i. And so finally, i to the fourth is equal to what? Is equal to minus 1 squared, which is just 1. OK, so what have we learned here? We've learned that i to an even power right, is going to be the same thing as minus 1 to that power. And i to an odd power is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to i times i to an even power, which is just what? Which is going to be minus 1 to the n times i. <laughs> right? So in other words, even powers of i are always real. Odd powers of i are always imaginary. Good. So how does this help us? Well, we can simply resum our exponential function in terms of even and odd parts. That is to say, I can take e to the i theta equal to the sum over even stuff, right? 1 over n i theta to the n plus the sum over odd stuff, 1 over n factorial i. Now, this even odd kind of paradigm is going to show up a lot in these particular calculations, so let's be a little bit more careful with what we mean, right? So by even and odd, I mean e to the i theta is equal to the sum over n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2n factorial, i to the 2n, theta to the 2n, plus the odd bits, n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, i to the 2n plus 1, theta to the 2n plus 1, right? OK, good. So let's use that relationship that we just discovered for i, namely even and odd properties of powers of i, to write this as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2n factorial times minus 1 to the n, <laughs> good, uh, theta to the 2n, plus the sum from n equals 0 to infinity i times minus 1 to the n, right? Good. Over 2n plus 1 factorial theta to the 2n plus 1. Now, I split this up into even and odd numbers. Hopefully, that wasn't too much uh, of pulling the wool over your eyes, so to speak. Like, you can do it explicitly by just thinking about 1s and, and 2s and 3s and 4s and so on. And you can see that even numbers always look like 2n and odd numbers always look like 2n plus 1. So you're able to make this split. Hopefully, in other words, this resummation that I did isn't terribly complicated. If it is, that's fine. Just practice because it'll come naturally. It's it's really not as bad as you think, especially if you just kind of work out the first few terms in each one and kind of identify them. It'll, it'll come quickly. So important point here is you can go onto the internet and look up the definition of cosine and sine and look and lo and behold what do you see <laughs> well there is no rep, rep, uh, 
mention of imaginary numbers in the definitions of sine and cosine. But what this tells us is this is literally the definition of cosine. Did you know that? Cosine, that same thing that we use to measure angles and triangles and, and all that kind of stuff, inner products, whatever, is actually defined in terms of a series expansion just like e to exp, e to the x, the exponent. Literally the same thing. Um, finally, we'll pull the i out over here, and we have what's left over is that sum over all that junk with that guy with that i outside, which is now here, and that's just sine theta. Gasp, the Euler relation. <laughs> that is literally uh, a mat, it's just literally a matter of expanding the sum. Um, an important corollary, <laughs> corollary, depends if you're British or not, uh, of, of the Euler relation is the fact that cosine of theta is equal to e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over 2. And similarly, sine of theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2i. And so you can use this to prove other things that you may have seen in the past, you know, like cosine of minus theta is equal to cosine of theta. In other words, it's an even function. Sine of minus theta is equal to minus sine of, of theta. In other words, it's an odd function, right? And hopefully that makes sense in terms of even and odd powers of the function theta. Anyway, uh, that was the Euler relation. Now, let's observe a fun fact about matrices that's related to the Euler relation. That is to say, we're going to start pro solving problem 2.7 here. And problem 2.7 defines this matrix J, which is I sigma 2, which is just given by 0, 1, minus 1, and 0. And it asks you to observe the simple fact that J squared is equal to minus the identity. Boom. All right. Piece of cake. Now, this is fun because in some sense, J here is behaving like the complex number I. Because if you square it, it gives you minus 1. Only it's 1 times the identity matrix. So here's something for you. We can do this whole same thing again and now consider the exponential of a matrix, right? So let's do that. So let the exponential of a matrix just be given by exactly the same formula, right? 1 over n factorial m to the n, where m to the n is multiplying the matrices by each other n times. Um, cool. So let's say, what do you say we... Uh, write the following matrix. So uh, what, am I, what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say, consider the following matrix. Z equals no. Scratch that. So let's consider the following matrix. Let's have E to the I don't know, let's call alpha J. Right, and let's expand that thing out in terms of the exponential, the definition, the, the infinite series, or whatever. Uh, but this time with matrices, and see what happens. So we know that this is approximately, you know, this is the identity plus alpha j plus one over two factoria alpha j squared plus dot 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 dot. But what's important is that j squared is equal to minus the identity. Right, so that's identity plus alpha j plus one over two factorial alpha squared times minus the identity. And moreover, what do we know? We know that j times any even power is going to be minus 1 to the n times the identity, just like i. Similarly, j to any odd power is going to be minus 1 to the n times the identity times j, another j, that plus 1, right? So uh, just like the imaginary number i. So. Now we can expand again. We can do the whole even and odd trick all over again. So e to the alpha j is equal to cosine alpha times the identity matrix plus j times sine of alpha. You, you can use literally the exact same argument to, to, to rebuild this and observing the fact, you know, cosine alpha is equal to the sum over all even numbers, 1 over n. 2n factorial minus 1 to the n, da, da 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 alpha to the n, 2n, right, and so on and so on. So if you have seen some of these sums before, right, with the cosines and sines, hopefully that explains why that guy, that little n there, is not even. It's just always by itself in both cases. But anyway, uh, good. So that deals with uh, problem 7. So finally, let's, that might be problem 8. 
the problem n minus 1, where n is the number of problems. Finally, let's work on the last problem, which was going to involve a lot of the same work that we've done so far. So you're asked to, def um, to prove the following. So recall from problem 1 our little operator s sub z, which was equal to uh, v dot s, where s is the matrix, uh, it's a spin operator, right? So this is given by what? This is uh, vz, vx minus ivy, vz, vx plus ivy, uh, you know, or you can expand it explicitly in terms of those Pauli matrices, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Now, you are asked to prove the following. Prove that e to the s sub z is equal to, what is it equal to? It's equal to cosine theta plus v, the magnitude, the whatever, the, the, the unit vector version of v <laughs> dot s uh, times sine theta, where theta is equal to h bar over 2 times the magnitude of that vector. That's what you asked to prove. So we're going to prove this using exactly the same properties we've been doing so far. That is to say, we'll write out the full exponential, we'll split it into even and odd terms, sum up the even terms, sum up the odd terms. Uh, why? Because of the following fa fact. V dot s squared is equal to what? Right? Well, that's v dot s times v dot s. And maybe you recall that the spin uh, matrices square to 1 <laughs> right or at least the Pauli matrices do they right so you may recall that sigma x squared is equal to the identity similarly sigma or excuse me spin operator s which is equal to h bar over 2 sigma x squared is equal to h bar squared over 4 times the identity right so what we're going to find here is that similar to the complex numbers we're going to be able to sum up the series differently for odds and evens okay so let's go ahead and do that First, let's verify that uh, v dot s squared, right? So that's uh, vx sx plus vy sy plus vz sz times the same thing all over again. I'll spare you the algebra, but you can go back and, and figure this out if you want. But it's just like expanding any trinomial, <laughs> right? Uh, squared, so that's vx squared sx squared plus vy squared sy squared plus vz squared sc squared, the diagonal terms, and now the cross terms. So that'll be plus vx vy times sx sy minus sy sx. Just no, plus, excuse me, I, gave it, I almost gave it away, <laughs> plus VXVZ times SXSZ plus SZSX plus VYVZ times SYSZ plus SZSY. Good. That's what that whole thing is equal to squared. Now, here's the best part. SXSY is equal to minus SYSX. Uh... If you, we proved that a little bit in the lecture, if you don't recall, um, you can just do that calculation and prove it to yourself uh, shortly. It was related to the commutators that we do, which is, by the way, is another homework assignment that I'm probably not going to make a video for since it's just routine um, computation. But this is actually true uh, for all of these guys. They all kind of anti-commute, if you like. And so that's zero, that's zero, and that's zero, and that's because that's zero, 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 zero. So all we're left with is just that, right? So what is that? Well, that tells us that v dot s squared is equal to v mod squared <laughs> uh, times the identity times h bar squared over 4, right? In other words, vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared times h bar squared over 4 times the identity. Piece of cake. Uh, you're going to want, yeah, this may sound like really fast. My expectation here is that you've worked this problem out, <laughs> and, and so you're going through it again. If you haven't, don't worry. Um, just do it. Because <laughs> uh, if, if unless you do it, you're not going to get it sunk in there. Anyway, good. So it's proportional to the identity, so it's just some number. So what that tells us is that v dot s to the 2n, therefore, is given by this magnitude of v squared h bar squared over 4 all to the nth power and then times the identity right easy what else does it tell us it tells us that v dot s 
to the 2n plus 1 is going to be equal to this junk times v dot s. So v to the 2n h bar to the 2n over 4 to the n uh, times v dot s, that plus 1. It's right there. Okay, awesome. So now we hopefully have enough information to go and start expanding in that exponential. Good. Okay. So e to the v, what are we calling it? All right. e to the sz is equal to sum over n equals 0 to infinity 1 over n factorial v dot s to the n. We're going to split this into even and odd terms now. So first the evens. Then the odds. Good. Now, what we just saw was a formula for both v dot s to the 2n and v dot s to the 2n plus 1. So let's go ahead and write that down. So that's n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over 2n factorial times h bar to the 2n. 2, well, h bar, let's just do it h bar over 2 magnitude of v to the 2n, <laughs> good, plus uh, times the identity, good, plus 1 over 2, the odd bits, which is this even bit thing, times one more copy of v dot s. Okay, so now let's be very clear about, there's one little trick, if you like, left in this book, and that is to observe the following. We're going to take the magnitude of that vector v and put it there, okay? So let's do that. So we're gonna take that magnitude of that vector and we're gonna put it there. So that, the 2n, that's the 2n plus one. Now, recall that s is equal to h bar over 2 times sigma, right, where sx and sigma x and so on are related. So I'm going to pull this s out, put the sigma there, and then I'll add a plus 1 to this h bar over 2. So in other words, we pulled out the magnitudes, right, the, the magnitude of the vector v and the magnitude of the spin operator, that h bar over 2, and we put that into this, this quantity here, okay? Um, why did we do that? Because it'll make the cosine and sine definitions fit. <laughs> That's why we did it. In other words, we can write cosine of h bar over 2 v times 1, just using the definition of cosine that we saw earlier in the video. And here, what we see is sine of h bar over 2 v times this junk here. Now, this matrix here. Now, we can restore uh, our definitions by the kind of throwing normalization constants around, right? So let's just write that down. So we can write this back as h bar over 2 v, co you know, cosine of that junk plus sine of the same number. Good. Now I can multiply and divide both sides by h bar over 2 magnitude of v, right? So that gives me v dot s divided by magnitude of v um, h bar over 2. Awesome. There, there it goes. Um, this is the Euler relation for, uh, I guess, in general, the Pauli matrices. This is a, uh, this is a special property of the Pauli matrices. That's kind of, in some sense, why they're so very useful. There's a lot of different ways we can extend this story, uh, but that, that is enough for now. I wanted to emphasize the fact that. It's the Euler relationship. If you really want to cause red flags to flash everywhere when you're talking to another physicist, say Euler. <laughs> I dare you. In fact, don't. Just, just don't. Just, just don't. It's Euler. Okay. Have a great day, everybody.